relating uh, my first experience meeting uh, Amir, my first memory, which is probably about four years before his first memory of meeting me. Um, <laughs> I, so I was a uh, prospective grad student here, I guess it was winter 2006. Uh, I think they'll be drunk in the end. Uh, but after first accepting position here. Okay, so there's a story there. But in any case, so I met Amir in, in one of these meet and greets. You know, I asked him, what do you do? And he said, I'm interested in small bold probabilities and large mutations. So I thought to myself, you know, after kind of chatting for a bit, wow, this is stuff I'm never going to do. This is boring. <laughs> 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 okay, so I'm going to give a talk about small ball probabilities and large mutations where they take into the equation and stick out the cube. Uh, and there are kind of three lessons to be learned in this talk. Uh, and progressively, uh, uh, so the first will actually be about the nature of, of these uh, small, you know, these probabilities, these tail probabilities and large deviation. That's number one. Uh, second is more philosophical. What will kind of underpin the, the method is some exact solvability in, in the spirit of what Alexei was talking about. But what we'll see is that actually formulas are not enough. Sometimes it's necessary to reinterpret formulas in terms of other probabilistic objects and then leverage our understanding of those objects. And so that'll be the kind of philosophical message. And the third message uh, of all the younger people here is uh, that if a mirror tells you something is interesting, then it might take a little while, but it is interesting, and you should really focus on it. Uh, and so that's really the lesson I've learned many times over. OK, so the, um, the objects that we'll be looking at are the one plus one dimensional stochastic heat equation, and uh, KTC equation. I'll just remind you, we've seen in the present in Shurov's talk, so you have a, a function of time and space. And so the heat equation is this normal heat equation perturbed by a space-time multiplicative noise. This is space-time noise. Uh, yeah, I won't bother going into the definition so much. And then the KPZ equation, which is formally given by the law of Z, is this. These are kind of familiar equations to many people. So it's a hamilton jacobi equation perturbed by additive point noise. And of course, there's a whole story around making sense of this, which I won't go into. The, uh, the question I'll be dealing with is, how small can the solution to the stochastic heat equation get? Uh, from some initial data, or how negative can can, can be. Yeah. So what stochastic heat equation looks like, I'll, I'll fix an initial data uh, for now to be a delta function, so the fundamental solution. A little later, by time, we'll talk about more general initial data. But in short time, the solution will look like a sharp heat kernel. But of course, there's randomness driving this. And the question is, you know, how, how much does the randomness impact that? And, and then for that matter, you know, as over time, how close to zero will this get? You know, usual <coughs> kernel decays one over square root of time. And you know, what's happening here? And uh, how small can it get? Um, the stochastic heat equation, the various reasons one studies this, you can either through a finding cast or just kind of like uh, different representation, you can think of this as giving you somehow the, the evolution of a sea of particles that are diffusing but are being killed or, or multiplying at some random rates related to the space-time white noise. And so these large deviation questions relate to massive die-outs or massive explosions in the population, right? Because in reality, it's not going to be as smooth. There'll be randomness, and you want to know the nature of that randomness. And of course, for KPC, the question becomes about random growth. Uh, if we take the logarithm of this sort of uh, delta initial data, which doesn't make sense, and so you take time to be a little bit positive, the log of a heat kernel is, is a <coughs> negative Gaussian and or negative uh, quadratic. And so what we're really looking at is some sort of random interface that has a general parabolic uh, behavior. So we want to know over time how does this fluctuate and how does this decay. Okay. Now, in order to uh, kind of identify the interesting scaling, uh, I need to introduce some, some centering. So I'm going to look for convenience at time 2t, just because it will save me putting 2 in other places. And so the first result uh, that one should know is that if you run this KTZ equation for some 
fairly long amount of time, uh, what will actually happen is that the overall growth speed will be negative, and it will be <coughs> negative with a speed of uh, 120, 1 over 24. Uh, so after a while, actually, the height function will have moved down significantly. Uh, or in other words, here you'll actually have exponential die out of the population at a certain rate. Now, you don't see that if you just pick the first moment of z, which is the usual heat equation. And this is because of the phenomenon of intermittency, that there is a very small probability of very high heat that occurs, and that kind of compensates at the level of z. But at the level of h, you, you will see it for typical behavior. Um, and so then there's a fluctuation, and, and uh, as predicted by the Kadarka z Jane universality class, that's of order t to one third. So I'll, I'll define this, I'll call it epsilon t. And uh, the first result of this type is uh, what uh, you hear Jeremy Costello and myself prove, which says that this converges in distribution to this uh, Tracy Whittem GUE distribution. So this is telling you kind of where the action lives. You know, what, what's the interesting scaling in the center? Now, the question I'm going to be interested in is what are the tails of this district of this random variable for finite time? And there's kind of a few different things you can play around with. You could, of course, play around with other initial data and ask what happens. You could also play around with uh, the time frame you're looking at. You know, this is a long time result. If I take time to not be infinity, but to be like a million, is it going to be well described by the GUE and the tails? What if time is of order one, or time is of order one over a million? Uh, and then for that matter, how deep into the tails do I need to go to see different types of phenomena? So this is the uh, question. Okay, so the, you know, we might gain some information. So there are kind of two heuristics that give us some information about the finite time behavior of this. Uh, actually, let me, let me make first a, a remark about kind of what's been done before. So the, the, re the earliest result, which actually justifies being able to take logarithm, is work of Carl Mueller from 1991, who showed the almost sure positivity of z. So it's not obvious a priori that that this noise doesn't actually make z equal to zero sometimes. Um, and then this was strengthened, and there were results that showed that if you look at, at h without any of the centering and scaling, uh, that for any fixed time, eventually you have Gaussian decay in the negative direction. So this is a result of Gregorian and Miranda Flores, and there was earlier results of uh, Mueller and Neular. Now, the issue with these results is that they, they are not adapted to the centering and scaling. So in fact, a simple question like, prove that the variance of, of this object, of this uh, epsilon, converges to the variance of GE was, no, was, was an open problem. Yeah, because none of the tail results were actually uniform in any time sense. So they don't really say anything aside from uh, order one time. Okay, so what does one get uh, out of kind of the first heuristic, which is understanding just the nature of GUE? So let me draw the uh, plot of the density of uh, epsilon t, and this will kind of be for some generic t. And so it looks it's not quite that extreme. Uh, so it has some decay. Now the FGUE distribution suggests that on the right-hand side you have a decay, which is exponential with, uh, so let me say s is my, my variable, uh, of s to the three halves. And on the right-hand side, FGUE has this e to the minus 112 actual value of sq. But this is, there are various ways to see this <coughs> case. You can get it from random matrix theory using kind of push Coulomb gap, and that'll come back again later. Or you can get it from Pan-Levay 2 expression for this and uh, for stochastic area operator. So what one might expect is that for any finite time or a reasonably large time, the tail of epsilon t will always be of this sort. It won't be Gaussian, but it will be cubic. So that's one kind of heuristic, which is uh, what I'll call the, the strong coupling, or the strong disorder heuristic. And then there's another one, which, which I'll explain briefly, which is, uh, as you might imagine, the weak disorder one. Uh, the way that that works is look at a very, very short time equation. So as time goes very small, you can do some rescalings, and you can transfer the small parameter onto the noise. So what you're really looking at is 
putting an epsilon in front of, of the noise term here. Now, when you put an epsilon and you ask what's the probability that my height function evolves in a certain way, this becomes a large deviation problem in the space of space time white noise. Right? When x1 is 0, this is just a Hamilton Jacobi equation. So for small epsilon going to 0, you can actually write down a rate function for the entire space time evolution. Now, this hasn't so much been done rigorously, and Martin has some work done with the forest of using regularity structures for other types of stochastic PEs of the sort. But on the line, for GPT, this hasn't been done, but in the physics literature, people don't worry. And um, so it's just event so private type of thing. It's event so private, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then you can ask, among all of those possible evolutions, which ones would get into the one point deviation you're interested in. And this was done uh, over the last 30 years, that the names are uh, Voloshnik, uh, uh, Kolokov, and Karusha. Uh, they, they're the ones who uh, really pushed this through. And they get a very nice prediction which says that at least in the very, very short time, weak disorder regime, you have a different decay, which is like e to the minus, and that is an interesting constant, 4 over 15 pi, after the value of s is a pi pass, e to the one third. Okay. Where does this come from? It's some variational problem in their space of trajectory. This is, okay, so, um, what I'm going to show to you, so there'll be two, two results that I'll describe. So let me this. So the, the result, the first result, and, and I won't state it so precisely, because there's some epsilon and deltas, uh, is uh, work with my graduate student, Pramit Gosal, in the past year. And what we prove is that for any t bigger than, say, 1, and s bigger than some constant, constant, uh, we proved that the, actually these are the two behaviors that are present in the tail, and you have the following uh, phase diagram. So when, when s, here's a, a sort of cutoff at t to the two-thirds, so for s anywhere up to order t to the two-thirds, so meaning kind of a small constant times t to the two-thirds, the decay is exactly governed with matching upper and lower bounds by this cubic. With this constant. Now, anywhere far past t to the two third, it's exactly described by this uh, weak disorder. So you have the strong, and then you have the weak. Here. So, for instance, when t is seven, <coughs> so this is not such a big number, and so really you're governed by this five half exponent. But when t gets to be a million, then you're probably seeing more of, of this. Now. So, the, so that's the, the first result, is, is this up matching upper and lower bounds, identifying the large deviation behaviors, sort of these tail behaviors. Uh, now there's an intermediate region, which is this region of order t to the two thirds. And we give bounds, but they're not the tightest of bounds. They kind of have a little bit of wiggle room. And so the natural question becomes to figure out what the what behavior is in this critical window. And uh, it's not determined for finite t, but if you, Think about this for a large t, it actually corresponds to the large deviations from the KTZ equation. Right? So if I look at the probability that this epsilon t is less than, say, z times t to the two thirds, so z will be negative, well, that's the same as the probability that h at times t plus t over 12 is less than or equal to z t. So the type of result one would want is take the logarithm, divide by t squared, you take limit as t goes to infinity. And you want to show that this is equal to some function of z. So the second uh, result that I'll describe is, uh, well, there's work with Gasol, uh, to do Sol, uh, his student, And then there's a, a, a result of Li Chang's, uh, in which I'll explain to you how to derive what this large deviation rate function is. Okay. The first result, PRL, I mean, not math, uh, and I'll explain, but I'll, I'll explain this because it can be made into math and there's some work needed. Uh, what so happens, is contagious, right? Well, you know, what happened was I figured out how to do this using Coulomb gas, as we'll explain. 
Um, and before we got the chance to make it rigorous, Li Ching is very smart, then found another way to make it rigorous. Now the motivation is slightly less, but I think it's still a wonderful question to make sense of this, and I'll explain that as well. Okay, so. Okay. Um, and actually, there are, there, are, there are other approaches that, that I'll mention a little bit later that can be done. So, why is this hard? You know, why is this not an obvious sort of thing? You know, this is the test of ID, why can't we just extract tail? Well, part of it is because you know, there is this non trivial centering and scaling, and, and as time goes to infinity, you really have uh, some other effect. It's not really so much about the. Uh, stochastic PE, and it's more about the integrability. And so for this, we the, the real starting point is the formula in uh, Jeremy and, and Giddy, um, which I'll, I'll recall to you. And, and I'll, I'll remind you various ways that one might prove this uh, by the time. So the formula that, that we proved was for essentially the Laplace transform of Z, of the stochastic heat equation, but I'll write it in terms of epsilon. So it says that if I look at this uh, Gumbel type factor, t to the one third, epsilon t plus s. Okay, so before I go on, let me just tell you something. So e to the e to the something, say lambda of x, this looks like a kind of complicated function, but really you should think of this as approximately equal to the indicator function that x is less than zero. Okay, right, when x is large, Lambda goes infinity, let's say. When x is large, this becomes e to the infinity, which means the minus infinity is zero, and the other case gives you one. So this is basically a probability distribution, right? So it's the probability, when, at least when t is large, of, of this event being less than zero. And on the right hand side, there was a threat home determinant, an infinite determinant, L2 of s where this uh, k, so it's not a very complicated object, the integral over the line of the area function multiplied in two coordinates, and a function sigma of r dr, where sigma is actually another approximate uh, indicator function. So sigma looks basically like Okay, so this was the formula, and now you see it actually very easily as, as t gets large, on the right hand it becomes a probability, and on the, uh, on the left hand it becomes a probability, on the right hand this just becomes an indicator function that r is positive, and this becomes the area kernel that one knows from the random matrix here. Now, why is the lower tail difficult from this? You know, you have a formula, why don't you just plug in s going very negative? The problem is, when s goes very negative, you're basically looking at this operator on the whole space. And it doesn't go to the zero, it doesn't go to one. There's no obvious limit of the behavior of this operator. And this is a general fact, actually, in, in a lot of these random matrix problems, the numeric problem, is that oftentimes you have determinants that go to zero, but operators don't. And that's, there's no problem there. It's just that the eigenvalues are going to zero. And it's very hard sometimes to access the eigenvalues. So this is, this is a, a legitimately difficult problem. In the case where you replace this with the indicator function, there's a method through Panlevay equations. And actually, in our original work, we also wrote down some Panlevay, some generalized Panlevay equations, and we had no idea what that had to do with them. And we couldn't even prove directly that this probability distribution goes to zero, let alone exponential or you know, cubic or whatever. So that, at least in, at the time, seemed like a, a dead end. It, it turns out it, it's not, and, and I think we now know how to do something around that, but that's a different story. So now I want to invoke the sort of second message of the talk, which was that sometimes formulas are great and sometimes they're not great. And this is an instance where it's actually nicer to have to rewrite this formula in terms of another probabilistic object. So this rewriting is, is a work of uh, Alexei and Vadim. It's a very nice short paper. Um, and what they do is they show that this determinant is equal to uh, an expectation <coughs> over the airy point process, A is 1 to infinity, of some very simple multiplicative functional, e to the 1 third, 
make things less simple. Uh, I should say, actually, very briefly, this determinant had actually come up earlier in the literature. Kurt Johansson had a nice paper uh, in which he studied what are called positive temperature uh, free fermions. So this is like the GV measure of positive temperature. So this is your GV, like a zero temperature. And he got this determinant describing the fluctuation of the, the rightmost particle of this famous free, of, uh, of, uh, free fermion, positive temperature. Uh, so in some sense, this actually even motivates this type of formula as being a Fermi factor uh, hitting the airy point process. Um, the proof of this is, is, is very nice. What you do is you use the fact that multiplicative functionals of determinantal point processes can be written as Fredholm determinants. And then you get some Fredholm determinant. It's not quite this. Now you use the fact that determinant of AB is determinant of BA, and you get this. Okay, so it's not a hard proof. But the observation that you should rewrite it this way is very pitiful. Right? And it actually came out, so Alexei had an earlier work in which he identified identities of this type between stochastic vertex models and, and McDonald's process type objects. So this sits a little bit higher in the hierarchy, which, which I really won't go into. Um, OK, so once this came out, it still, you know, embarrassingly, it took a little while for me to figure out that this is the right formula through which to derive these types of behaviors. But in retrospect, now it's quite obvious. So what I'll do is I'll explain to you how from this formula you can uh, prove this type of behavior, and then you can also derive the type of behavior that we're interested in uh, for five. So, so let me go, you know, and I, I'll give you the ideas. There's uh, certainly technical things that need to be done. I was Jim. Could you look at this uh, series of points and uh, look at the two strings from yes. so the middle? Yeah, can you prove it directly? So at the level of the <coughs> continuum, uh, what you would do is you would write this first as a Laplace transform of Z. You would Taylor expand, write the moment generating function. Unfortunately, it's a divergent function. On the other hand, if you just extract from this formulas for you know, the kth moment, you can match them to what you get by expanding this in, you know, in, in terms of this uh, power of you know, ETS as your variable. Uh, and those you can match, and that's done in this paper for the To prove this, you can prove it, but you need to go up to an integral model. So say from the stochastic six vertex model, you can prove an identity that says that on the one hand side, you have a, a Q Laplace transform in the stochastic six vertex model, which through some work that we've done limit to KTPC. And on the other hand, you have a expectation of multiplicative functional of a sure process. So it's the usual thing. You have a third model of only You sit above and then you degenerate so yeah, there's no direct, you know, there's really no direct proof. All of them, all of the results about taking the exact formulas always go through some discretization. Except the except for moment formulas. You can't make them. Okay. Um, so I'll just, you know, let, let's uh, see how to derive this uh, sort of first bound with uh, for me. So I'll remind you, so the, yeah, the airy point process, the determinantal point process, ordered particles, A1, A2, A3, is what you get by you know, looking at your large random matrix, focusing around the edge you know, of, of the random matrix where you see the area point process. So how, how might we start to see these, these two different behaviors? Well, you know, in the expectation, so first of all, this I'm going to think of as being well approximated by the probability at the right hand side is even for p of order one, as long as s gets large, this is not equal. This is kind of approximately the probability that epsilon p plus s is less than zero. And so as long as s is getting you know, large, this is giving you a tail probability. So I, what I need to do is I need to study the behavior of this right-hand side, likewise for s getting large. Now. There are, it's an expectation, so I can kind of split it over different events. So what are two different events that one could consider that go into this expectation? Well, you know, one event is that, imagine that all of the AKs, in particular A1, because they're ordered, is less than uh, minus X. So when, when this happens, meaning that my every point process moving to the right, I ask that it's less than some, some number minus s. So I push them off. 
Now, that has a small probability. The probability of this event is, by what we said before, about e to the minus 112 s cube. But when this happens, you can check this expectation, or you know, the, the uh, term inside the expectation is basically one. Right? Because actually, this is also an approximate uh, indicator function. Right? And this is also approximately equal to indicator function that a k plus s. So, so that gives you a sort of lower bound of this sort. Now, there's another behavior that, that, that can come in. Right, this is, of course, an exceptional behavior for the A's. Now, you might ask what happens when the A's are typically the way that they should be, right? You know, we know that they're not generally pushed. So, first of all, you need to ask, you know, what is the typical behavior of the AKs? Well, the AKs are, one can show very tight bounds of this sort, they're approximately equal to the, I, to the uh, zeros of the area function. And you can actually show uh, simultaneously for all K that they're very close to this bounds of the sort. Um, and so that tells you through some classical results that they behave in this sort, very closely approximated by something of order k to the two thirds. Now if you take these typical values of the AKs and you plug it in, well, the probability of that event is very close to one, but the multiplicative functional can be computed, and the value of the multiplicative functional gives you this order 15 pi uh, s to the pi pass e to the one third. Pretty simple calculus problem. Okay, so it's not quite as easy as this, right? Because I've only identified two events and this gives me a lower bound as long as I can kind of show that two of that they each have roughly the right probability. Um, in order to get, you know, make this really go through, what you need is, you know, you're looking at S large, so you're, you're looking at many, many points, and what you need to do is demonstrate large deviation bounds on the counting function. So what you really, the guts that go into this is, you look on large intervals, and you ask how many points are there versus what you expect. Yeah. And you want to show upper and lower large deviation bounds on that. So one of the sides, the upper bound, uh, can be proved uh, kind of in the spirit of how you prove large um, uh, linear statistics. So you use the fact that counting functions here in a sum of renewalies with, I, you know, with uh, parameters given by the eigenvalues that the operator projected onto the region, and, and then you use something called Bennett inequality and concentration inequality, and that proves one of the sides of the sort of large deviation. The other side's actually much harder, and it required uh, analysis of a, of a lesser known version of the Pamela A2 equation, which is called the Appelman Seeger solution, and the different asymptotic decay, and luckily, some work of this sort had been done recently by Thomas Bosner, and we were able to leverage uh, some of his formulas, and of course, there's more analysis on top of it. So, okay, so this is very much the sort of heuristic sketch for how one proves these, these sort of bounds. Now, what I'll explain is how you can take this reasoning and actually compute the formula for phi minus. Uh, now, of course, the caveat being that we haven't proved this, Approach. And I'll tell you exactly where where one needs to do something to make it into a proof. And I think that something can be done. Uh, it just needs to be done. Um, so you just mentioned the right tail. Yeah. So the right tail can be determined uh, more so through the moments of z. Uh, though you can also use these exact formulas. The right tail uh, we were able to show bounds of this sort. Uh, the exact constants that you know we plus or minus a little bit. The right tail is um, Okay, so what I'll explain in the last minute is uh, how how one goes about computing this phi minus. And this is a nice calculation. So um, z is less than zero, and we're looking, and this is before, this is the limit t goes to infinity uh, of the probability. And, uh, I'll just write it in terms of epsilon. So epsilon t less than or equal to dt. Now I'm going to use this formula. I use the fact that this is some sort of approximate identity. I'm just going to transfer this over to an expectation about this ex uh, or a, a sort of uh, cumulant generating function. So I'm going to replace the probability by this multiplicative function. So this will be, uh, sorry, this is 
digits all log. Uh, and now I'll write it in, in uh, exponential form. So it really looks like a cumulus generating function. So it's a sum k1 to infinity of some function phi on phi in a moment. So this function, little phi uh, e s k, is just what it should be. It's log 1 plus e to the e to the 1 third k plus x. Okay. So it's the thing, it's the thing that you get by just kind of turning that into exponential form. So now uh, we know that you know we're looking at for large deviations, we're looking at a, a window of size t to the two thirds. So we should look at the airy point process on a window of size t to the two thirds, right? Or, yeah, of size t to the two thirds. Now, when you do that, the points are getting more and more packed together because they have this sort of edge of a semicircle shape. So, the empirical measure actually on the window of size t to the two thirds has order t points. So, let me define an empirical measure I'll call mu t to be one over t, and then the sum of delta masses at uh, airy points, but scaled down by uh, e to the two thirds. So this one, one should believe is going to be converging to a, to a limit, and, and we'll look at the behavior of this empirical measure. Now under this same scaling, I can look at this phi. So if I look at phi t and e to the two thirds, and you know the points I'm looking at again are of order t to the two thirds, so let me just say a times t to the two thirds. Well, this is well approximated by t times uh, a minus c the positive part. So you know you just you just look at the behavior. You know when this is large, you get the log, and this you take the log of the exponential, it gives you the positive part. And then the so the idea is now this whole expression gets replaced by you know, this limit squared uh, log <coughs> of the integral against mu t, okay, and then uh, you know with some approximation minus t a plus. Okay, so now you know what to do. You want to do large deviations, right? Sorry, and there's a t squared here. T squared, you got one t from here and one t from here. So what you should hope for is that uh, there's a large deviation rate function for the empirical measure. Okay. So one should have this. The problem is that mu t is equal to approximately some measure mu. This is very informal. It should be like e to the minus t squared, some rate function of mu. So we'd like that this is true. And we know this is true for the GUE measure, but it worked with at least. And so one would hope to take a limit at the edge. And I'll explain what you get in a moment from that. But for the, for, let's assume that there is such a form, in which case you can continue, and by Laplace's principle, you get uh, that it's only the sort of maximal behavior here, the t's cancel, and this should give you the minimum overall mu of your uh, cost function plus uh, this integral a minus c plus. The question is, what is this rate function for the area point process? You know, part of why it's difficult, you know, in, in the, uh, for the GUE, you, you have this Coulomb gas interpretation, you can immediately write down what, at least at finite end, what the energy functional is. Here, you're looking at an infinite particle system from the beginning. And so there's some challenges in this. For instance, even which mu should this be supported on? You know, what type of conditions on mu should there be? So what, what we computed, and of course this hasn't been proved, but is uh, if you take a suitable scaling limit at the edge of what uh, Ben Roos and Jim they did, and we can prove a formula, or uh, we can conjecture a formula, conjecture, that says that this is equal to, so uh, there's a situation where you have your measure, uh, minus what I'll call mu star, 
So mu star is, is the thermodynamic limit. It's, it's the measure that you get uh, by taking the edge of the semicircle or using the sort of asymptotic from the A's that I just said. So it's a, a square root type behavior. So you look at the difference integrated over R of your measure versus that measure, this should be zero. Now, if it's not zero, then the rate function is infinity. And if it is zero, then the rate function takes the form, uh, say, j of mu plus u of mu. u of mu, I'm not going to write down. It's not complicated. But it's uh, zero on, on mu, which is supported on the negative side. So it's basically a penalization that comes from moving particles in, out of the bulk. Okay? And actually, for our problem, it doesn't matter. J of mu is, is an interesting one. And this is the limit under suitable massaging of the, um, is it because we're looking at the left? Because we're looking at the left over the right. Yeah, so there's, that, that one can actually prove that this mu doesn't matter, assuming it's true. Um, you have the electrostatic uh, formula of, uh, of uh, anyway, mu star. Okay, so this is the formula that we, that we <coughs> by taking a limit. And now, if you uh, plug this formula in, you can solve the variational problem explicitly. Now, I'll just draw for you what the, because it's kind of heuristically nice to see, uh, what do you get? So, first of all, so here's zero, here's z. My penalty function is linearly increasing from z to the right and zero to the left. Now, the usual mu star is, is sort of square root. It's not planning out, it's square root. Okay. Now, what happens is that the actual minimizer is zero for some amount of time. It really pushes itself. And then it looks like this. It has a logarithmic uh, uh, singularity, and then it drops down. I shouldn't have drawn it to the top. And then it comes back and it sits right above the bulk. And, and, and the integrals, of course, will uh, integrate to zero. Now, when you do this, you get, for this particular function, you get the expression for, for phi minus. It's not a very complicated expression, but it will take 30 seconds to write down. It involves some square roots and things of that sort. Um, and the important thing is that it's, it's the formula that, uh, on, on the one hand, when z goes to zero, or when z goes to infinity, it recovers exactly what you expect. So when z goes to zero, it gets due to 112 dq. And then on the other hand, it gets due to 4 over 15 pi d to the pi half. So it really recovers the, the two extreme behaviors, and it gives you uh, exactly what's happening in between. So, so this is what we did. We did this over the summer. And then we chain, um, we came up with a very nice idea, which was that uh, one should look for a different description of the area point process and try to use that description. And so the one he used was the stochastic area operator, in which you have the, these are correspond to the eigenvalues of an area operator perturbed by white noise. And the idea there was that you can transfer the large deviation problem that we're interested in into a large deviation problem on that one dimensional white noise. And that one you could solve explicitly, and, and, and he ended up getting the same formula and, and proved it. So it's very nice work. Um, this is, it, this, it doesn't, no, it doesn't, well, it, it agrees with this. It doesn't give this. And in fact, this method, it's a little bit more complicated because if you take more general test functions, right? You imagine you take enough test functions, you'd be able to prove it. This method breaks down aside from essentially this test function. So there's something, you know, maybe there's a little bit more. There's something very subtle in his method uh, where it works for this. But if, for instance, if the test function is not linear, but rather step, and his method produces So he's, he was lucky. Um, so I think a, a wonderful problem is to prove this. Okay, but better lucky than smart. <laughs> okay. Well, that was when I worked in finance. <laughs> that was the year before the crash. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, I'll, I'll take two minutes. And I just want to. So at, at, the, at Gerard's birthday conference, John Dominique Deutschel asked me a question, and actually prompted me to start thinking about all of this. So somebody else should ask me a question today. But um, the question was, 
if you start not with belt initial data, but with Brownian motion, two sided, stationary initial data, uh, prove that under the right centering and scaling, the variance converges to the variance of byte range distribution, which is what the limiting distance is. So I thought about it and, and first I figured out how to do this. But this doesn't tell you anything a priori about other initial data. Um, and in fact, this structure, you know, the, the exact formulas in this structure, doesn't really always go through for other initial data. So ultimately, we came up with a way, again, with Prameet, to get around this. And it, again, leverages the second idea about using other probabilistic objects rather than formulas. And the idea there is that for general initial data, one point distribution, there's a distributional identity that says that you, you can write that in terms of, of sort of in, integral with respect to the spatial solution to the narrow wedge solution, to the narrow wedge initial data. This is basically the idea of, you know, you have fundamental solutions, you convolve fundamental solutions, you get the solution at a later time, you reverse, there's a little bit of time. So the problem, if, if you can understand not just the one point large deviation, but the spatial large deviation for the narrow wedge solution, then actually you can get arbitrary initial data one point tails. That's, that's the message. Now how do you do that? Well, we don't really have the best formulas, but there is another vestige, vestigial effect of the integrability, which is something called the KPZ line ensemble. So it's, an, it's a, kind of a, another interpretation of the KPZ where you have a, the top layer of this infinite ensemble of curves is the solution at time t of the KPZ equation. And then you have all these other curves and they have some energetic interactions called the Brownian Gibbs property. And by using that spatial Brownian Gibbs property, you're able to actually prove uh, bounds of the same sort, but for arbitrary initial data, completely arbitrary initial data. So it's very much universal. Um, okay, so let me just close by mentioning a few very brief problems. One would like this for other models. And actually, John Dominique uh, reminded me that he actually was interested in a different polymer model. Uh, which is the, the uh, semi-discrete polymer model. And so that's a question to think about. Um, we are thinking about this right now for, for ASAP and stochastic six vertex model, and I think we'll be able to get results about large deviations and tails for that. Um, I, I think proving this, uh, and actually even giving a, a Coulomb gas type description, an inherent description of the area point process as a Coulomb gas in infinite particles in a potential is, is a good problem. Uh, Ultimately, I, I want to make sense of this uh, uh, generalized panel base 2 analysis. And then really, there's also this question of understanding kind of the full space-time large deviation for KPZ equation. So in short time, this is a problem that should be doable in this meek noise theory I mentioned. But in long time, you'd like to know, if I realize a certain large deviation, how, how does it look around it in space and time? You know, what, what, what evolution actually realizes that? I think it's a problem that can ultimately be done, but requires some, some additional effort. Okay, well thank you. I'm happy to Thank you. 
distribution of most of the system and the population. That's right. Well, that's how we derive it. You know, but, but to prove it, I, I agree that maybe with kind of suitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you can formulate a. You can try to formulate this conjecture as either a consequence of or directly as a reason for a large random matrix. Um, there's probably some work to go between the two. You know, showing that showing something for a large random matrix is the same as showing it directly for the. I, I think for so for that for the large n, uh, I think what we did is essentially a proof because we just, we just take their formula and take the limit of it. Yeah, I mean, maybe not, you know, it's, you're just kidding, it's, 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 it